Right. So now I'm going to put on my hat because we're talking basketball. We're talking basketball. Uh, we are. This is this is the part of the show where we switch from the topics at hand and we go into a personal story about somebody you know. And today we're talking about one of my favorite basketball players, one of my favorite people. Um, I just think he's a swell dude. Giannis Antetokounmpo. He is. Giannis. Giannis. Yeah, he, he's, he, has, he has an unbelievable story. My When I first became aware of his story, he gave an interview talking about he and his three brothers um, lying in, a, in their shared bed that they barely fit in. in, in can Greece. you imagine those guys sharing a bed? That was That's one of the funniest parts of the story. Um, and all of them dreaming about uh, playing in the NBA. And now all three of them are. Um, so it's, is it three or four brothers? He has four brothers who all play basketball: Francis, Alex, brothers. Costas, and Thanasis. And we'll have we'll have this put up on screen. We'll get it. Well, I'm sure by the time this goes to edit, there's a nice photo of this above our faces. Yeah, I, I mean, I think uh, if we were trying to do a dry immigration podcast, we could go into O visas and how um, yeah. and how the NBA functions. But I think it's much more interesting just to talk about his his story and how it. Um, Take me through it, man. So you, you've done the research on this. So, and I'll just kind of ooh and ah and, and um, not pretend that I haven't read all your research, <laughs> which is the truth. So, yeah. So uh, Ted um he was born in '94 um, in Athens, Greece, um, to Nigerian immigrant parents. Um, was that was that Beauty and the Beast? That's when Beauty and the Beast it. came out. Beauty and the Beast was that '94. You're obviously a much bigger fan than I am. So he's probably I'm a little a, embarrassed. He could be. A, I'm not. I'm not saying he is, but he could be a Beauty and the Beast. He could baby like that could have All been right, the that, song. That'll be in the next the next podcast. That could have been so. If you want your kid to grow big, you have to procreate <laughs> while Beauty and the Beast is playing in the. Like, yeah, yeah. Is that a fair like? Is that a good lawyerly conclusion? It's a good medical conclusion. Very good. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm a medical expert. Yeah. <laughs> He he had a very uh, he had a challenging childhood. His his parents um, were Nigerian immigrants. Um, they lived there without status. Um, he was born in Athens, Greece, like I said, um, but Greece does not have birthright citizenship. Yeah. Um, so his family was was existing in um, in an unlawful status. His he and his brother sold uh, watches on the street, I believe, yeah. for a while. He. Um, he was afraid to go out at night with his brothers from uh, Golden Dawn, the neo-Nazi party yeah. um, in Greece. They're incredibly active in his neighborhood. Um, and in power. And in and, power. And in power. And in power. Yeah. So he, yeah, it was, it was a tough childhood for him. And it kind of all turned around um, when Spiros Velinatis, Velinatis um, discovered him. He's, he's a Greek basketball coach. Um, his brothers always, he and his brothers always loved to play, but he was kind of the first one who got noticed. How much um, credit does that guy deserve though? Like how much, how much talent does it take to walk down? She'd be like, Oh, <laughs> holy shit. You're six foot 11. You're 12. I know what you should do because you're six foot 11 and 12 years old. <laughs> you know, he may have also stood out a little bit in the youth, uh, Greek basketball leagues. Yeah, it is possible that he, yeah. that he stood out quite a bit. That's, um, a, that's sort of like putting LeBron James in a in a Jewish league yes. in Philadelphia. Yes, it's definitely. like a, why does he stand out? Oh, he doesn't wear a yarmulke. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> that's what it is. That's what Ari Shafir was the tallest player in his Jewish league. He's a comedian. Oh uh, yeah, he's yeah, six yeah, foot yeah. four. You know, he's like that was he's a giant. Four. Yeah. <laughs> uh good he, special by the way yeah so th this guy by mm. some miracle um found these guys found these brothers um he offered his uh his parents jobs he kind of helped lift the lift the family up kind of um steered him through um the various like development leagues and yeah, but and, greeks are superpower in basketball like they are, they are right they are. so it's, it's the greeks croatians french they're kind of always playing it's serious there. Spot. it's yeah. serious there yeah and he um a lot of american players that's true. Yeah. And he was yeah. in incredibly decorated through all those leagues. Um, and the interest where the story gets interesting is his NBA career almost didn't happen. Um, it almost didn't happen when he had kind of reached the pinnacle of these Greek leagues. Um, he, he wanted to come to the U S I think the nuggets were looking at him. Um, and he didn't have citizenship. He was essentially stateless. Yeah. Um, so 
there was a huge back and forth um, for months and months where it wasn't even clear if he could come. Um, and essentially, he had to go through the special process and petition the, the Greek government directly. And long story short, they gave him Greek citizenship. Okay, but let's break that. that so that is fascinating. And it's fascinating because a lot of people are not familiar with the stateless concept. There are stateless people all over the world. Okay. For a brief moment in time, I myself was stateless. All right. I was born in a country that doesn't exist. For example, or there's lots of ways to become stateless, right? Right. So you're born in a country that doesn't exist, or you're born in a country where there's no birthright citizenship, and to have citizenship in your original country, you have to, you know, either get registered through your parents, which you might not be able to do because, like, you know, Giannis, you're already living somewhere. Um, but a lot of times, you can just like kind of lose your country. And what that means is that you are kind of a non-entity under international law. Right. Right. You're a non-entity. So even to adjust status in the U.S. can be very problematic, right, if you're stateless, because what are you switching from? Are you an right. arriving alien? What are you? Um, if you're seeking asylum or, you know, you are – or if you need to be deported, for example, where do you go? Right. Right. And it doesn't always end the way you think it should. Oh, well, they've got no country to back to. Of course, they should stay here. There, there are plenty of detention centers around the country which have been filled with, for example, stateless South Sudanese people right. who will stay there for five, six. I, I remember with one case, I think it was in Louisiana. I mean, he might have been in Stewart for a while. Um, but he was there for like five years because he couldn't get a passport. And so he was just right. forced to stay in prison. People end up having to shop around for their, uh, for their statehood. I mean, Giannis was reaching out to Nigeria mm -hmm. uh, to try to get a passport. Oh, yeah. Is that how it works? You're like shopping around. That's funny. So that's, I mean, that's, that's how it was described in, in his story. He was, um, he needed to come here for the NBA draft basically. And that's like, they were up against this, um, this deadline of the NBA draft and the Greek government wasn't budging at first. You need at least one parent born there, um, for them to consider it. And he was reaching out to Nigeria to try to get a passport. Um, and at the last minute, the Greek government uh, just stepped in. Um, and yeah. It's pretty unclear from my research exactly what strings were pulled, uh, yeah. but I think they realized, I don't know if it's the economic opportunity they saw him having or his, his potential fame. I'm really not sure, but it was kind of a 11th hour um, Greek government. Here you go. Passport. Yeah. Um, and then he was all set. Yeah. They're lucky that he was the first one to go to the NBA. I don't think they would have done that for Thanos. It's probably true. And they're like, well, this... Uh, <laughs> This guy's gonna probably average three points a game. I don't uh I don't think it's uh worth it taking a bribe for that. Yeah. But but Giannis, he might be top they're like he might be top twenty all time. Yeah. If they knew he would be what he is now, they'd be like, Oh, we should definitely do that. Like if they knew Absolutely. they had the next they would have they would have flown him themselves. I they would have flown him themselves. Yeah. yeah. Okay, but this so that's an interesting little tidbit though, right? So immigration's not created equal, right? Is right. one thing that we see in this story. Right. Right. So how many People with the same origin story as Giannis are still stateless on Greek streets, right? Exactly. If exactly. you've ever traveled to any sizable European city in the past decade and a half, you've seen, because you can't not see it, the loads of migrants from Central East Africa that just live on the street, sell trinkets, right. um, are totally kind of ignored and ostracized. Right. right from those societies right and that phenomenon has had profound political implications uh, and we haven't even you know we, we're going to be touching on the syrian crises we're going to be touching on uh mass migration events on the 90s eventually in these podcasts but giannis is one of the boat people essentially yeah exactly you know, that, that's the crazy thing and he's one of the boat people that was completely ignored and, you know, terrorized right. by countries that were not ready to see dark skin right. as uh, someone that's part of their nation. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I, yeah. I think the interesting thing is, you know, flipping through your news sources on any given night, um, you read about. Title 42 and a family at the border um, who's stuck there. And then you flip over and you're watching Giannis in the NBA. And you could be looking at a very similar immigration story that's turned out, you know, in a very, very different way. Um, so it's not created equal for for anybody. For and, anybody. And and yeah. I wonder, right? So he has to, you can't not be acutely aware of the fact that you are 
as, as someone stateless, you're not even a second class citizen because you're not a citizen at all. Right. You're, you're something below that, right? right? You're totally vulnerable. And um, you can't help but see the racial dimension of that. Right. And now he comes to Milwaukee. Now, Milwaukee, you know, as far as I know, it's one of these cities that does have a black population from the Great Migration in the 1900s. Yeah. That was due to the fact that uh, post reconstruction Jim Crow created a terrorist state, right? Exactly. In the southern US. Yeah. Uh, but you still have a population there that's like heavily isolated. And I wonder, like, what Gianna sees when he goes on the streets. Right. Does does he see some of the elements of his life as a stateless entity, stateless person? Yeah. Does he see some of that in the black population of Milwaukee? You know, what is his philosophy around being in a in a, in a mostly white state otherwise? And then right. you think about all these things must be going through his mind, right? You know, but he stayed so gracious. And diplomatic, and it's this thing that I always talk about. Like in the United States, we're all single. Uh, we're we're all a country uh, with a population of one, in the sense mm -hmm. that we all have to be diplomats when we go outside. That's one of the wonders of America. Right. You get here and you realize everybody has very unique lives in their private homes. They have they come from a bajillion cultures, and to get through your day, especially if you live in a non homogenous place, which I can't quite say where I live now in Connecticut. Right, but could say in, in North Carolina, could. Can't, yeah. Yeah, I can't really know like where I live on the coast. I can't really say it pretty homogenized, but yeah. it's the closest thing I've ever seen to uh, like the Scandinavian country up here, but mm -hmm. <laughs> New Haven not, right? And Hartford not, but then New Haven not and Hartford not, that's its own thing, right? That's its own uh, historic result of historical segregation, but whatever. Right. Right. But you have to be a diplomat of one, uh, and that means sometimes holding your tongue. It means like sometimes uh, finding uh, a way to say something without being insulting. And people who take that to uh, to a level in the way that Giannis has is, is pretty impressive to watch. I'm not right. sure I would be that unbitter. And I say that as a former refugee. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, for him, yeah. it's an even more extreme example. If you, you know, imagine the the interplay of these two things in his head. You know, he has this lived experience of being stateless, you know, um, selling trinkets in the street, like we talked about, um, experiencing Milwaukee through this um, through this lens, and then uh, being made a millionaire superstar, who, you know, who every, every American um, knows. Who, yeah. Not even every American. But he's, he's known all over the world. Um, Do you think Ari Shafir and the other kids in the Jewish Basketball League uh, really are like, I'm going to grow up to be like Giannis? I hope not, for their sake. <laughs> I'm going to grow up to be seven foot two and be able to dunk it from the three-point line. Yeah. That's funny. Yeah. Every American kid wants to be Giannis, and they know they can one day with enough hard work. Yeah, okay, okay, what is, okay, so getting to technicality, what is his current status, though? Like, So he did end up, he, he comes on... I'm, I'm guessing some sort of B1, B2 visa after getting his Greek um, citizenship. And then what happens? Does he come, does he come directly on an O1 visa? Does he? Basically it comes on, basically it comes on O1 visa. Um, okay. Yeah. And if, and certain people who don't. Which can be event based. You can apply for those event based. So I'm sure they applied for it for like the draft and then saw right. to extend it for the season or something. Right. Exactly. Um, so what are the technicalities? So, 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 so what's he on and then how typical is that for other basketball players? So for, for the NBA, O1 is the most typical. Um, there's three to six evidence categories that you need to prove uh, regarding your profession and regarding what why you qualify for this. Um, ex aliens of extraordinary ability is what, is what yeah. the O1 visa is. So there's three to six evidence categories. Yeah. Um, this is the NBA jam visa. Right, right. right. <laughs> um, this, is the, this is the... It is. The aliens <laughs> of extraordinary ability take over the bodies of... Charles Barkley, <laughs> Muggsy Bogues, and uh, what was his name? Uh, what was the tall, lanky white guy? Well, anyway, <laughs> he uh, he's not in one of their bodies. He's um, not at the at this time, no. at least. So no. he, yeah. So he he the met... aliens would have beat Michael Jordan if, if Giannis was there. I think uh, if they took over Giannis's body. Yeah, I'd, I'd put money on that. I'd put money on that. that. Yeah, yeah. Um, Maybe. Yeah. So for the technicalities, he basically has to meet some of these evidence categories. Um, he needs um, a, la a 
basically his job to vouch for him so that the NBA team that's interested in, in him, or, or maybe the, the organization as a whole does the original um, letter. For, it's for, an I-129 right. filing. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and that's that's about it. So you have to prove your field of expertise through those categories, um, get a little support from um, an employer and, and obviously some other some other. Do they ever transition stuff, to like a green card or citizenship, right? That's a fantastic question. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I, I, yeah, I would I'm, assume so, right? Like after enough years on no one, you'd, you'd have a, maybe you become a franchise player, like the NBA petitions for you, right? One of the team's petitions for you. Yeah, that would make sense to employee. me. I'd, yeah, I'd like to look into that more. Yeah, let's about, look into uh, that. We'll mark that. Mark, mark that. Yeah. How do you become a citizen in today's NBA? From the O one, yeah, right. I become a right. U.S. citizen. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. Well, very cool. So that's Guyana's story. Um, we're going to be covering some other thing. We're going to be covering Jokic in a future in a future uh, episode next week. Um, okay, so yeah. just we wanted some conclusions. Okay, uh, you had some stats for us on the on the NBA in terms of what this uh, what they are. Give us some stats. Right. Yeah. I mean, the the NBA is quipped as being the most uh, progressive sports uh, sports league in our yeah. country. And um, if you're judging that by a metric of immigration, I think that definitely holds up. Um, for the 2020-2021 season, um, there was a international player on every single roster yeah. um, in the NBA. Yeah. Um, 107 total from 41 countries on yeah. opening night. Um, and then comparing this to the 91-92 season, there were just 23 international players overall. Wow. Um, so it is... Now, you said progress. Is it a progressive league or, or, or like an international league? Because some people in the league still believe the earth is flat. <laughs> <laughs> and some other people also believe that Jews control the media and the world. So I don't know if I would say it's the mm. most progressive league. It's certainly one that has been active, um, the most activist-driven league, which is which is like a positive thing. But I think, I would I think you make a good point. But if you're comp- putting it next to the NFL and the MLB, it's yeah. not it's not a high bar. Come on, you know. come on, <laughs> come on. But the, the NFL is like a plantation. It's like a professional exactly. plantation. Oh. Apologies. No, sorry. That was, a, there was, that was like a sensor. That was like a far off sensor. They're like, what? Yeah. Did you just call the NFL a plantation? <laughs> yeah, the NFL is a plantation system um, yeah. business. Anyway, There's a great South a... Park episode about that. Uh, it's actually about college football. And Cartman, uh, Cartman walks into the president's office uh, or the athletic director's office of some like college. And he goes, and he's dressed as a uh, Colonel Sanders. The plantation owner. He's like, hey, how you doing? He's like, uh, hey, I'm just trying to figure out how do I get some of those slaves that you got? Guys like, uh, what? Excuse me? He's like, oh, yes, not slaves. How do I get some of that money for free from people that are working around getting paid? Of course. Yes. That's changed now because now we have sports endorsements and young college millionaires. Right. Especially if they're twins and blonde. Apparently there was a, did you see the blonde twins that made like millions university of Miami? They're kind of like nondescript point guards. Right. Yeah. I can't remember their name off the top of my head. It's, it's a, well, it's funny because those two little beautiful little white girls uh, (laughs) who, who who play point and shooting guard at university of Miami on an otherwise all black team. They're the ones making all the money. Can you imagine those locker room conversations? It's like, uh, it's like, I don't think you guys are the best uh, players on this team, but somehow you're richer than me. And I'm trying to figure it out. I'm trying Oof. to figure out what that is. And they're like, yeah, I don't know. I don't know why that might be. Have you tried Pantene? Have you yeah. tried? <laughs> right, right, right. There was this horrible thing that happened in the 1970s and 80s where black people started lightening, lightening their skin because apparently it yeah. mattered. Yeah, boy, is it getting hot in here? <laughs> is it getting hot in here? I just, my point is, I don't think you can fix a plantation system. Yeah. And the NCAA yeah. is that. I mean, the NCAA was created specifically to control black athletes. I don't know that history. There's but a great I'm, Taylor I'm, Branch series. Taylor mm-hmm. Branch wrote the Pillars of Fire trilogy of Martin Luther King, great right. historian. And he was the first one to call the college football plantation system, but also to put the NCAA on blast because the student athlete uh, moniker is actually made up out of thin air it was designed not to have to pay for medical costs of football players very interesting also to lock in black players right into the university and 
pull them away from what was then common practice of getting paid. Right. Right. Like Will Chamberlain was paid when yeah. he was in Kansas. He rode, he rode, drove a Cadillac. Like that was just yeah, yeah, yeah. whatever. So the huh. whole thing is designed with a very particular purpose in mind. But anyway, wow. I'm sure we'll get it right. I'm sure we'll get it right. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, the Welcome to America podcast. Is that what we call it at the beginning? I think so. Yeah. Welcome to America. Welcome to America. Uh, or did, wait, 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 wait. What was the Eddie Murphy movie? Coming to Coming, coming to America. That's what we America. called it. Coming okay, it's not Welcome to America. Coming to America. Thanks so much for listening to the Coming to America podcast, where we've obviously worked everything out ahead of time. My name is Damien DeNoble. <laughs> Eli McDonald. This is Frontier Tech Law, and we will see you next time on episode two. Eventually, we'll have a guest. Probably not for a while, though. Have a great day.